They'll meet themselves. We have someone that has to mute themselves. Johnson's whole vote is committed to yeah. helping community inventory and appointments available to businesses and organizations. Someone's in their car. Good afternoon. This is Bobby Reggie. This afternoon. Oh, to get us started, I wonder if everybody would mute himself or herself. Uh, that would be helpful. This is like NPR special report. So. Um, okay. Um, Welcome to the League of Women Voters of North Carolina's uh, celebration webinar. And now we rise the next 100 years of the League of Women Voters of North Carolina. As I said, I'm Phyllis Demko, a member of the board, um, of the state board, I should say. We'll begin with a brief video. Um, but while the video is playing, one of you would go to the chat and put a few things in there. First of all, your name, the town where you live, uh, the name of your local league, and three words, at least three words that would describe what you expect to see for the next 100 years from the North Carolina League. Uh, and a few housekeeping details that we need to fix before we start. As I mentioned, we do want you to mute yourselves. Uh, speakers, I would like to remind you, however, when you start speaking, be sure to unmute yourselves. Um, and if you do not wish your image to be shown on the recording, uh, you would want to go to the stop video icon uh, somewhere on your screen. Uh, this will be available for people who can't make it to today's program. If you want to use the active speakers view, then uh, you should um, look for the icon uh, that would allow you to do that. So you only see the content of the slides and the speaker's face at the same time. Um, little note about the technical piece. Uh, of course, we're a little nervous about the internet. We don't know what's going to happen over the next hour and a few minutes. Uh, though the League has been in business for the last 100 years, we have to remember that we've only been using Zoom for the last six months, so anything can happen. Another milestone for us, and I think we're doing a great job so far in adapting to this new environment. Um, if someone's video should go off, then we are prepared among ourselves who are working with this program to pick it up from another computer. So give us just a minute and we'll be back online very shortly. As I mentioned, we're going to be seeing a brief video called The Perfect 36, The Vote That Changed America. This is, of course, refers to the vote by the Tennessee legislature to ratify the 19th Amendment, which put it into law. Looks like we may be having some audio difficulty. Um, give us just a minute. Was there no sound? No sound. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's try it again. this. What 
if women couldn't vote in 2020? Had it not been for a single vote changed from nay to yay in 1920, the history of women in politics would have been very different. Ratification of the 19th Amendment came down to a single vote. And it was cast by a 23-year-old from Nyota, Tennessee. Perfect 36 is a theatrical event likely to feel like deja vu all over again. We will keep the reins of power. You know we're itching for a fight. And while we hold the reins of power, it's hard times, am I by 40 singers, actors, and musicians, Perfect 36 celebrates the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, reshaping the arc of America's future. The 72-year suffragist struggle to gain the right to vote for half the nation was a force to reckon with. Hundreds of women arrested in front of the White House, countless marches across the country. How long, how long, how long? Do we have to wait? How many weeks and months and years? How many lifetimes will it take? How many lies? How many bribes? How many broken bones? How long, how long do we have to wait? The ratification of the 19th Amendment stalled at 35 states. And that brings us here to the Hermitage Hotel in Nashville, Tennessee, where the drama unfolded among a menagerie of legislators from all around the counties, heroic suffragist leaders from around the country, anti-suffragist leaders, and high-profile business lobbyists. We ain't gonna be, no, we ain't gonna be, no, we ain't gonna be. And in the heat of that Southern summer, illegal whiskey flowed freely, Jim Crow racism flourished. And the promise of a vote changed like the wind in an ironic scenario that gave men the power to make the decision about women's rights. Just close your eyes. I'm worried about men. Put your head on my chest. I'm worried about many things. Concentrate on the moonlight. I'm worried about Democrats. I'll take care of the rest. And Republicans. When it comes to romance, can't you see? I'm one of the best. God's In the sobriety of this hallowed chamber, the stakes could not have been higher as our fragile American democracy played out as the world watched. So buzz up, ladies. Show them you ain't no more. It's this political vintage from which Perfect 36 is made. It all comes down to this, right here, right now, we rise. Victory's in our sights, right here, right now. Hope you enjoyed that. That sort of tells the full story, doesn't it? Uh, we've got a great program for you uh, this afternoon. We're honored to have uh, keynote remarks from two league national presidents, our own Carolyn Jefferson Jenkins, who was um, president uh, some years ago, and current national president Deborah Turner. We're also delighted to have with us Allison Riggs, who is familiar to us all our very good friend uh, with uh, social justice. 
and who is also on the uh, national board presently. We're so pleased that a number of our partner organizations have joined this webinar to congratulate us on our 100 years. And we are especially pleased that our governor, the Honorable Roy Cooper, has recognized the achievements of the league. Here is his statement of support for us. Hi everybody, Governor Roy Cooper here. It's an honor to celebrate the League of Women Voters on its second century of service. As we celebrate 100 years of women's voting rights, it's clear that the League and its dedicated members elevate civics in North Carolina and across the nation. From voter registration and candidate information to monitoring election boards, your advocacy for fair elections and voting rights helps our democracy work. I'm grateful for your inclusive work to engage voters and candidates at all levels of government, no matter their political beliefs or party affiliation. And I appreciate all you're doing to help make sure people can vote safely during this pandemic. And I don't have to tell you how critical the 2020 election is and that your efforts to engage voters are more important than ever. Thank you for all that you're doing and keep up the great work. Good morning, everyone. I'm Joe Nicholas, the president of the League of Women Voters of North Carolina. In my fancy attire there in the picture when we had the governor's event in September. I want to thank you for joining us for this event and helping us to celebrate our history and envision our future. We will also be talking about our great voting program, Vote 411, and we look forward to gathering some new funding from people to continue this program for publicity and education about it across our state. While we acknowledge our history today, we will focus on how we as a league envision ourselves going forward, both immediately with so much at stake and in our country and especially over the long term. Next slide, please. Look at what we have done. Getting the right to vote for all, working on educating our communities on all of these issues that are so important to our communities, particularly at the voting information fighting to make sure our votes are count during our elections during this pandemic, building leagues throughout North Carolina, speaking on these issues on behalf of our members, and we continue to grow in membership and leadership, and we're excited about that. Next slide, please. What we will continue to do in the next 100 years is to make sure that every person in North Carolina has the knowledge and the power to vote on all things having to do with our democracy. That is our privilege. That is our right. We want to continue growing leagues throughout the state. We want to fight for all of the people and voters on all of the voting issues. We want to become more open for all people, regardless of the ethnicity and their sexuality and their age. Also, our main thing here is we are empowering voters throughout North Carolina and defending the democracy. Next slide, please. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the new president, elected president of the League of Women Voters of the United States, Dr. Deborah Turner. Deborah has served on the LWV US National Board from 2016 to the present. She served as Vice President of the League of Women Voters of Iowa from 2011 to 2015 and was President of the League of Women Voters Des Moines Metropolitan from 2010 to 2015. She obtained her JD from Drake University and her MD from the University of Iowa. She has been a gynecological oncologist for 30 years. Deborah served on the board regions for the state of Iowa and was entered into the Iowa Women's Hall of Fame in 2013. She lives in Nebraska and has two grown children, a son and a niece. Quote, I believe no child should be restrained by the circumstances of their birth. The league through our leadership in the democracy space can make this dream a reality. Welcome Dr. Deborah Turner. Next slide. Thank you, Joe and League of Women Voters of North Carolina. 
It is an honor to be with you today. And while I wish we could all be together in person, I am delighted to see leagues finding creative ways to meet digitally and have these important conversations. We have just over six weeks to go before election day. And while many voters will plan to vote early and through the mail, we all know our work will not be done on November 3rd. The COVID-19 pandemic has presented new challenges to our election structure. From delayed primaries to attacks on vote by mail, we are working around the clock to ensure voters have options to safely cast their ballots this year. Therefore, we have been engaged in more lawsuits than ever before. As you are aware, here in North Carolina, the League of Women Voters challenged several onerous voting laws, including signature match rejection practices. We applaud the League of Women Voters of North Carolina for achieving a victory for voters by getting a notice and cure fix in this case. Last month, we marked the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, and earlier this year, the League celebrated our centennial. I am proud of how far the League has come during the last century, but looking ahead, know we have a lot of work to do, both internally to stay relevant and continue our transformation, and externally to continue superior service to the American voters. My vision for the next millennium can be summed up in a word, progress. Progress for League, progress for women, progress for the American voter, and progress toward racial justice. The dictionary definition of progress is forward or onward movement toward a destination or goal. And the goal is empowering voters, defending democracy in order to form a more perfect union. The League has entered an era of evolution. We have made a deeper investment in ourselves through intentional organizational transformation and deepening our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. That way we can truly become an organization reflective of the country we serve. We can, we can accomplish this goal by applying an equity lens to everything we do, from budgeting to scheduling league meetings, to engaging with partners, to making policy changes, and yes, to selecting our leaders. By making DEI part of our DNA, we have the power to realize our goals and ensure we are inclusive and equitable in our work. The civil unrest that we have seen over the last several months is our call to action. The structural racism that has existed in this country since its founding continues to be on the front page of every newspaper. This is the wake up call that America has long required and long ignored. Structural racism touches our lives in many ways from education to healthcare to economics to policing. The bandaid has been ripped off. Now is the moment to heal the egregious wound and not rebind it and hope it will heal itself out of sight, out of mind. It doesn't work that way, trust me. I'm a doctor. It is our responsibility to take this work to the next level as allies in the civil rights community. Frankly, this is not our space to lead, but as members and supporters of our organization, we must lean into this moment and offer our unity, our support, our voices, and our hands. That may mean being prepared to sit down and stay away if we are asked to do so. Humility and listening will serve us well. There are those who say the League is a democracy organization, not a social justice or civil rights organization, but how can you separate them? At the heart of the issues, democracy, social justice, women's rights, and civil rights are intersectional, intertwined by the collective goal of advancing the right to vote. The League sees equal access at the ballot box as a way to reach the goals of social and racial justice. While we continue to fight for that access in this election cycle, we are looking beyond November 3rd to the redistricting cycle that we will start next year based on the 2020 census. And that will have lasting impact for the next decade. I don't need to tell you in North Carolina how important redistricting is. It has long been a focus of league. And through our People Powered Fair Maps campaign, we are working to ensure that people have the say to participate more deeply in their communities in this time around. Another part of my vision for the League's future is to make our election site, Vote411, a common household name. As you know, it is the perfect nonpartisan tool to engage our voting family members, neighbors, and friends. This year, we have worked with our partner, Laleo, to translate the site in Spanish, ensuring we are reaching new audiences. This has long been a goal of our organization and doing this work in partnership has strengthened our relationship with a key organization. 
Having this content in two languages helps us reach more voters. In fact, we are on track to support 10 million voters on Vote 411 this election cycle. Even as we see new organizations pop up every cycle, the league's reputation in this space and our nonpartisan position sets us apart from others with ongoing trust from the public. We are grateful to uh, Dr. Turner for recording that message specifically for us. She was not able to be with us in person today. And note that she mentioned uh, some of the themes that Joe was talking about, the expansion of our league, uh, building new leagues, uh, strengthening our current leagues, as well as the uh, promotion of Vote 411. In fact, that Vote 411 program is uh, one of the themes of this webinar, and you'll hear about it a little bit more. We are interested in raising funds at the state level in order that we can promote it all across the state, even in those counties where there are no leagues in existence. Uh, as you know, uh, publicity can be very expensive, and so we are asking for your help through this webinar. Uh, we have placed in the chat uh, some links uh, for uh, ways that you can support the League, and we will mention this a few times uh, throughout the program. Thank you very much for your support. Now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Carolyn Jefferson Jenkins. Uh, in 1954, Dr. Jefferson Jenkins became the 15th president of the League of Women Voters of the U.S. and the first African American to hold that post. She has received many awards, but I just want to mention this one because it was personally impressive to me. Earlier this year, she received the Miami University Freedom Summer of 64 Award, which recognizes the spirit of the 800 students who gathered on the campus of Western College for Women to change the country during Freedom Summer in Mississippi. Just to note, the first recipient of the Freedom Summer Award was the late Congressman John Lewis. So our own Carolyn Jefferson Jenkins is certainly in good company with that. Carolyn's recent book, The Untold Story of Women of Color in the League of Women Voters, traces LWV's conflicted past and points our way forward. We are very pleased to welcome Carolyn today. Please put your questions in the chat and she will respond at the end of the talk. Carolyn. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Phyllis. I was not League President in 1954. <laughs> I was oh, 19. 98. So I had to have been a baby at the time I, I was president. But I that's am okay. so sorry. I missed out 1994, of course. 1998. <laughs> uh, okay. okay, thank you. Um, I propose a League of Women Voters, nonpartisan and non sectarian, to finish the fight and to aid in reconstruction of the nation. What should be done can be done. What can be done, let us do. That was Carrie Chapman Catt. Good afternoon. 100 years after this proclamation, is the fight finished? Again, I'll ask, given the abundance of information that you'll receive this afternoon, 100 years after the founding of the League of Women Voters, is the fight finished? So while you ponder the answer to that question, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to share this special occasion with you. I bring you greetings on behalf of all of the women who have and continue to put in the effort and energy to make this democracy work. Thank you to President Nicholas, to Phyllis Demko, and the Board of Directors for being leaders during this historic time in the nation and in the League. And finally, thank you to each of you joining us this afternoon who carry out the League's message on a daily basis and will continue to do so as you shape the future of the League. All right, so I've given you enough time to ponder the answer to the initial question. After 100 years of League education, advocacy, and activism, is the fight finished? And the answer should be a resounding no. If we paid attention to Perfect 36 and Dr. Turner's remarks, we know that the answer is no. We still have work to do. The fight is redefined with each new generation. 
The fundamental questions currently facing this nation lead to a serious debate over whether the fight will ever be finished. Is finishing the fight our charge? Should we accept that responsibility? And the answer is a resounding yes. As President Turner's marks, remarks reinforce, the fight is very real and our organization can and must respond. I chose to finish the fight as the theme for my remarks because it was not only the mantra of the league's founder, Carrie Chapman Catt, but it symbolically represents our need to be vigilant lest we lose any gains that we have made. I wonder what the fight Cat would identify, what the fight is that the, that Cat would identify today. I wonder why the fight in 1920 was not to make sure that women of color also benefited from the efforts of suffrage. As history records, Carrie Chapman Catt was a walking contradiction, especially on issues of race. Her racist comments are well documented. But despite her flaws and racist comments, in her enlightened moments, she was a visionary and she knew, as we realists know, that in a dynamic constitutional republic, the fight is never finished. And that is why the League of Women Voters stands strong in its mission after 100 years to empower voters and defend democracy. Understanding this allows us to amplify the good and learn from the inexcusable. My message, therefore, will be both inspirational, acknowledging both missteps and achievements of the past, and aspirational, allowing us to envision the organization that we can be. This commemoration is all about power, the power of our past, the power of our present, the power of our future. How we use this power affects how we change, how we finish the fight. The events of this consequential year remind us that social injustice, inequality, election integrity, and informed civic engagement are all fights we still have to undertake. These current crises remind us that together we have made it through adversity before, and using lessons learned, we can make it through adversity again. Times like these define who we are. The current acts of kindness and unity amidst the violence and intolerance provide a blueprint for the future. They show that we are forever linked in the pursuit of justice, an overarching principle of the League of Women Voters if we choose to actualize it. There are obvious fights for the League like getting out the vote and how to combat online election misinformation. These are fights we cannot forget because they are interwoven into our very fabric. But there are other less obvious fights where we now find ourselves compelled through our mission to act. That is what we are called upon to do here today. With all the fights before us, we still have to finish. The challenges of overcoming history can feel overwhelming. So for just this one day, I'm limiting my request to you. I've decided to use my platform to challenge you to finish one of our most important fights that can be finished during this centennial year. The fight to give women of color the recognition that they deserve in league history. On February 14, 1920, the League of Women Voters came into existence, but the fight wasn't finished because the discriminatory philosophy that permeated the suffrage movement transferred into its legacy organization. On August 18, 1920, when the 19th Amendment was ratified, the fight was not finished because women of color, including Native American, Latina, and Asian women, were still being subjected to racist barriers to voting. When the first elections of 1920 were held, women voting was 36%, so the fight was still not finished for white women either. Each fight, fueled by hopes and dreams, was often stalled by realities. The history that many portray of the suffragists and the League is a romanticized, sanitized version of accomplishments and achievements. The things we are most proud of, mentioning challenges only in the context of external challenges on our activities or issues. We want our heroes to be perfect, and that's only human nature. History reminds us that they are just people. History is messy, uncomfortable, sometimes unbelievable, 
particularly on issues of race. But from acknowledging these unpleasant truths can come a brighter future. The history of the League is a paradox. It is a story of strategic choices and recurrent themes of controversy, compromise, and collaboration. It is a story of constant tension between principle and practicality. And it is in the spirit of this history of resistance and resilience and renewal that I offer my remarks. Our legacy is in the balance. The current national conversation on race brings to the fore the League's internal struggle with its relationship with its members of color and the broader societal issue of race. Current events underscore the importance of valuing all people. The League has missed many chances to speak out on issues of racial justice in the past, but we can't and we won't do that now. To finish the fight takes power and this power comes from our history, the lessons learned, and the commitments we will make to the future to do better. Our power is in the stories we remember, the stories we tell, the stories we create. We cannot hold the nation accountable if we do not put our own house in order. As we all know, the League was born from the struggle for the right to vote for women. And I am here this afternoon to remind you that women of color were there too from the beginning. But for them, the ratification of the 19th Amendment was not the universal celebration it was reported to be. The fight was not finished because the women had to make voting a habit. The fight was not finished because while winning the vote for women required 72 years of advocacy, for most women of color, it required an additional 45 years with the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The contradictions and paradoxes of an every woman's organization that did not address in any effective, sustainable way its most critical issue of inclusion of all women, whether ideological or organizational or both, forces us to question why. If the League is to be true to its principles, it must acknowledge these truths and make an intentional effort to address them. I am constantly being cautioned that this topic might make people uncomfortable. And re my response is that this isn't the first time a League discussion or action has made people uncomfortable. Women having the right to vote made people uncomfortable, and it still does. So as we commemorate 100 years, be prepared to be uncomfortable. That's the League way. Uncomfortable conversations are always complicated, but necessary. Being uncomfortable forces movement. How can we stand up against voter suppression and gerrymandering and gender inequality and a host of other issues, but we won't face or fix ourselves? So I'm unapologetic about raising uncomfortable conversations. In 39 days, the results of our votes will determine the future of our nation. Let's be good stewards of our story, but let's be better stewards of our democracy. Let's make meaning of the fight we have before us. Let's use our passion, our purpose, our perseverance, and our power to determine the kind of country we want, the kind of league we want. This is our chance to get it right. What we know is that when the league is at its best, as it has been in advocacy and education on some pressing issues, it is a powerful force to be reckoned with. When it is anything less, as it has been in its relationship with women of color, it is less. We cannot overlook one of our most glaring deficiencies, our ability to deal with diversity, equity, and inclusion. That fight is not finished. The League of Women Voters marginalized the contribution of women of color in its first 100 years. Telling their story now obliges the organization to take a candid look at itself and do better. How do we commemorate knowing that the past 100 years were not perfect? How do we make sense of the changes in the organization and the society and the democracy? We need to use the power that we have gained to be bold, just as we did on other issues throughout history, to make this democracy work, to finish this fight. Needless to say, we are in the fight of our lives as individuals, as an organization, and as a nation. We can give ourselves permission to commemorate a flawed history, knowing that we can create a new narrative. The League is at a crossroads. At a time when the fundamental tenets of a democratic nation are being challenged, there is no time for the League to go backwards. 
As the league has evolved, it still does not represent the demographics of the nation in which we live. As a result, the good work that is done and the impact that it can have is not being fully realized. We must remember who we are and who we aspire to be. Everything that makes the league the league, its principles, its beliefs, its members, is what we know will continue to make us relevant for the next 100 years. The League of Women Voters, my organization of choice, is positioned for change. The next 100 years is about change. It's about building on the successes of the past and welcoming the opportunities of the future. We are entrusted with the legacy of the suffrage movement and challenged to move forward. Let's do just that. And now we rise. On September 25th, 2020, in this new normal in North Carolina, to finish the fight. Fight we will and fight we must by acknowledging our past as a prelude to our future, by telling the truth and using lessons learned to do better, by moving forward, by imagining the unimaginable, by reclaiming the power in our story, by voting. Let our voices be the voices of reason in 2020 and beyond. Let's educate. Let's participate in numbers previously unseen. Let's talk to each other. Let's listen to each other. Let's make courage more contagious than fear. I am an eternal optimist. I continue to be inspired by your energy and commitment. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for all that you will do. And thank you for allowing me to be a part of this afternoon. I can't wait to see what the future holds. Thank you for Carolyn for that inspiring message. It strikes me that I want to hear that message again and I'm very pleased that we're recording this. Uh, it may be that all of our leaders across the state would also want to hear that message. So uh, for those leaders out there, you might want to look at how that can be available to you. There's so much there in what you said to us. And now let's see if there are any questions from the chat. Uh, Jennifer Bremer, a state board member, will read any questions to Carolyn. Yeah, um, thanks so much. Um, we have a, a lot of people commenting in the chat of how important and inspiring this message is and saying things like thank you and bravo and, and so forth. And I, I certainly uh, want to second that. Thanks a lot, Carolyn. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, one, um, you said in the final chapter of your book um, that at various points in the past, the League was not ready to act to improve its diversity. Uh, do you think it's ready now? And if not, what will it take for us to become ready? Oh, thank you for that question. Um, the reason that I made that statement is because the, there was a push for diversity uh, in the late 1990s and we had national initiatives and we trained people and we had all kinds of advocates. One of the um, interesting dynamics of the league is that if there's not a champion there to continue the message when certain leadership leaves that message gets lost or put on the shelf. I am encouraged that at the 2020 at this most recent convention that diversity, equity, and inclusion is now a part of the bylaws. And that means that it cannot be dismissed. It cannot be put aside. There is an accountability measure associated with it. So I'm pleased that, I'm not pleased that it took this long to get here, but I am so pleased that moving forward, it is a part of the fabric that who, of who we are as an organization. And when I always say it's a part of the fabric that can't be frayed. The demographics of this nation are changing. And in order to stay relevant and impactful, the league has to change with it. So I'm looking forward to seeing how um, local and state leagues embrace this new bylaw. Yeah, great, thanks a lot. Um, another question is, I mean, as, as again, as you, as you certainly uh, mentioned in your book, and we did put the Amazon link in the chat, in the chat for those of you who are interested in, in getting your own copy. Um, and, uh, there are, there are a lot of uh, Black-led uh, women's organizations uh, that have been very active in, in, in the fight and continue to be active in the fight for, for, uh, for suffrage. 
and for voting for voting rights and promoting voting, particularly the sororities as well as uh, many church-based organizations. How can the league be a better partner for Black-led women's organizations? Okay, so I, I will give a candid answer uh, for this. Being a partner is a two-way street. And so it historically, uh, in many instances, when the league has used the term partner, it's we're going to work together on an issue that is important to me as a league member, not nurturing and solidifying and bonding a partnership that will sustain. And so reaching out to someone for a particular project opens the door for you to nurture that relationship and sustain that relationship. And that has been the missing piece. So it shouldn't, I, I mentioned in the book that it needs to be transformational, not transactional. And most of our engagements have been transactional. I need you to give me access. I need you to help me do this or we're, we're both gonna bring something, we get done the goal and we move on. So we need to stop being transactional and start being transformational. Thanks a lot. And we have a couple more questions here that have, uh, have come in here to the chat. Uh, one, uh, saying, someone saying that it, it takes courage not to be discouraged. How should we speak to our African-American friends to encourage them to join the league with very few African-American members? That is, I smile when I respond to that question because in 1966, Ebony Magazine did an article, a six page article on the League of Women Voters responding to that very question. And I was surprised when I found that because as you know, Ebony Magazine is a premier magazine of, for the black community. And I just was amazed at why they would do a six page spread on the League of Women Voters. They interviewed 20 women of color black women from across the nation and ask them that same question. How do you get more black women involved in the league? And Dr. Dorothy Height made the comment that it was even difficult for her to get her friends to join the league because they didn't see where the issues that the league was prioritizing actually affected their day-to-day -day lives or issues that would be beneficial to them. Her response to that, as my response is to your question, is that there are benefits to being in the league. And in that article, they talk about how being in the league gave access to those women to other positions. So because they were league members, they got appointed to commissions and they got appointed to boards that made decisions. They were then visible in the mainstream society, whereas before, if they were only members of what were considered black organizations, they were put in a box. And no matter how talented they were and no matter what passion they had, they were always put into a box. Being in the league gained them access to what was considered mainstream. Uh, thanks so much, Carolyn. Um, I think that's a, a really, a really good point. We do have uh, another question, but I'm informed that we're out of time. So we will send you um, any, this question and any additional questions that we get, and maybe you could write something for our newsletter. I will absolutely do that. Thanks so much. It's a really, really important topic. Thank you again, Carolyn, for that wonderful message. Um, throughout the program, uh, you will find in the chat a reference to how you can support the League of Women Voters of North Carolina. And we'll be putting that uh, link or set of links in the chat momentarily for those of you who just uh, joined us or shortly after the program began. Our principal interest in uh, funding right now is to get the word out about Vote 411, and we certainly need your help in making that happen across the state. During the next part of this program, we will have a few brief messages from some of our wonderful partners. We'll start with You Can Vote's triad director, Layla Lewis, followed by Dennis Burns, president of the Common Cause of North Carolina. Congratulations to the League of Women Voters on a century of service to democracy. Here in Guilford County, we have appreciated our collaboration with our local league chapter as we worked arm in arm to educate, register, and applaud high school students as they voted for the very first time in the 2020 primary election. We look forward to many more adventures with such a fierce group of women. Keep up the good fight, y'all. 
and congratulations again. Congratulations to the League of Hello, I'm Dennis Burns, board chair of Common Cause, North Carolina. Pleased to be here and salute the League for its 100 years of impact on the state. You've been our partner for five decades, educating and protecting voters uh, through public forums, improved voting machines, fighting suppression, and battling for democracy, including the struggle all the way to the Supreme Court to fight gerrymandering in 2019. So thank you very much and congratulations to all of your members. We're thankful to our two partners there uh, for sharing those remarks. Now I'd like to show you a little bit of uh, history, primarily as a stepping off point for uh, talking about going forward. I'd like to recognize Mary Lou Burnett uh, from Moore County. Mary Lou, to get your face on our screen, would you mind saying hello? Maybe she had to drop off. Um, Mary Lou and I know. Here I am. Oh, hello, there you are. Okay, uh, glad to have you. And uh, Mary Lou and her team uh, from Moore County put together this 25 minute video. We're not going to be watching the entire video. It's called The Story of Suffrage but we'll watch just the last few minutes of it uh, because it focuses very much on what we still have to do. But I encourage you to view the entire film, which you can find from the link that we will be putting into the chat. So we'll go to the video next. About six months before the amendment was passed, the visionary Carrie Chapman Catt agreed to merge NASA and the National Council of Women Voters to become the League of Women Voters. Did you know that there is no other national volunteer organization in America that inspires such a great degree of commitment from its members? As a direct result of that commitment, the League of Women Voters has evolved from what it was in 1920, a mighty political experiment designed to help 20 million now enfranchised women carry out their new responsibilities to what it is today, a unique nonpartisan organization with over 800 chapters in all 50 states and a recognized force in molding political leaders, shaping public policy and promoting informed citizen participation at all levels of government. The 19th Amendment guaranteed us the right to vote, but it did not guarantee us equal rights. It took 72 years for women to win the right to vote in America, and as significant as it was, it was not the end of the battle. During the 1960s and 70s, women were still marching, protesting, and fighting for equal rights. The right to open a bank account, the right to borrow money, the right to own a home or a business. And of course, the same battle women have fought for over 100 years, equal pay for equal work. Did you know that the Equal Rights Amendment was passed by Congress on March 22, 1972 and sent to the states for ratification? In order to be added to the Constitution, it needed approval by legislatures in three-fourths or 38 of 50 states. By 1977, the legislatures of 35 states had approved the amendment. In 1978, Congress voted to extend the original March 79 deadline to June 30, 1982. Did you know that the amendment fell three states short of ratification? However, two more states, Nevada and Illinois, did ratify the amendment, and as of January 15th this year, the Commonwealth of Virginia ratified and completed the needed 38. 
Unfortunately, there are still roadblocks to adding the amendment to the Constitution because of the 1982 deadline and five states that have rescinded their earlier approvals. Our own North Carolina state legislators consistently turned their backs year after year, refusing to ratify the ERA and assure women equal rights. Little by little, women have achieved their goals through the years of hard work and persistence. And now, we tip our hats to the next generations of young women who are marching and protesting on behalf of the Me Too movement, asking only to be treated with respect and as equals by their male colleagues at work, at play, and at home. As Carrie Chapman Cat said so eloquently on the day we won the vote, the vote is power a weapon of offense and defense, a prayer. Understand what it means and what it can do for your country. Use it intelligently, conscientiously, and prayerfully. The vote is won. 72 years the battle for this privilege has been waged. Voting is our only weapon to fight the portion of our society that would continue to treat women as second-class citizens. We won the first fight. We must win them all. We must speak out, we must march, we must vote, and we must never give up. About six months before the amendment was passed, the visionary Carrie Chapman Cat agreed. Good afternoon again. It's my pleasure to introduce Commissioner Catherine Maggot. Maggot from the League of Women Voters of Piedmont Triad. Between Catherine and Willie Taylor, who's going to be giving you a little bit of information, there are going to be two different um, events in order to celebrate our history. Catherine has been very diligent working with the Pomeroy Foundation to get a marker where uh, Gertrude Will did her first. Catherine, it is your pleasure. Would you unmute yourself and tell us all about this? And then we'll have Willie to come on to tell about another monument that's going to be having, happening. Uh, could you put the slide up of Gertrude yes, next, Wheel? Next slide, please. Gertrude Wheel became the founding president of the League of Women Voters of North Carolina on October 7th, 1920. She was born to a prominent Jewish immigrant family of strong women who founded the first women's club in Goldsboro, her hometown, and led campaigns to create the public library and city hospital. They set a demanding standard for Gertrude. Gertrude was beautiful, small, and very soft-spoken. She became the first in North Carolina to graduate from Smith College. Community members vied for, for invitations to her table at which the latest books and political and social issues were discussed. Guests always left wanting to read what she suggested and get involved in the issues discussed, said her nephew, David. Yes. Her family's civic engagement and philanthropy introduced her to states, political leadership, and national leaders. In 1908 and 1916, she served as Goldboro's Federation of Women's Club president. Gertrude realized that to achieve achieve social justice, self-improvement clubs would need to become civic reform organizations, and they would lead to the vote for women. So in 1914, she helped found, and in 1919, became the president of the Equal Suffrage Association of North Carolina during the state's fight for the ratification of the 19th Amendment. She traveled the state in 1919 to meet with leadership, rally supporters, and helpers to the cause during the Spanish influenza and came down with the virus, but recovered. Her final message to her members in 1920, think ratification, talk ratification, work for ratification. After the ratification on August 26th, Gertrude's suffrage pipeline together with North Carolina women's clubs taught women how to register and the importance of voting. And by the November presidential election, 120,000 women from North Carolina had registered to vote. Next slide, please. In honor of the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage, the National Collaborative of Women's History Sites created a mobile online virtual trail known as the National Votes for Women's Trail. 
This site is of great importance to the history of the suffrage movement, never before in its history and for the first time ever. They have gathered information in one place, documenting the 72 years of the movement and the countless participants. The William G. Pomeroy Foundation was so impressed with this online virtual trail that they generously offered to provide grants to erect a physical trail of historic markers in all 50 states, highlighting sites of importance. And historical marker in honor of our founder, Gertrude Will, has been approved by the Pomeroy Foundation, the only women's suffrage marker for the state of North Carolina, and it will be installed next year in front of the Guilford County Courthouse, where at a meeting in the building, the Equal Suffrage Association of North Carolina became the North Carolina League of Women Voters. The marker reads, Gertrude Wheel, 1879 to 1971, suffrage leader and president, Equal Suffrage Association of North Carolina, 1919 to 1920, led final meeting here, 1920, to found the North Carolina League of Women Voters. She will be remembered. Catherine, we thank you on behalf of the League of Women Voters of North Carolina for all of your outstanding and persistent working on this. This is just a major, major accomplishment, and we, we are so proud. Thank you. Willie, are you, can you unmute yourself? The other monument that's going to be uh, looking at is the one that Willie Taylor from the League of Women Voters of Piedmont Tried has been working on to celebrate the 100th, and it will be occurring next year also because of our pandemic. Phyllis, I'll turn it over to you. I think Phyllis lost her internet connection, so okay. we're going to go to the next um, section, okay. which is... Uh, oh, I'm back on back. now. Oh, I'm good. Back. Uh, yeah, I'm back on. Okay. Um, lucky me for the moment. Next slide. It's my pleasure to introduce Allison Riggs, who leads the voting rights program at the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. Uh, we have Karen Bell. Uh, I'm sorry. It's my right. internet connection fouling up has really got my brain screwed up. So no, let's go to two uh, shout outs briefly, and then it will be my delight to introduce Allison. We just have one shout out. Happy anniversary, League of Women Voters. I'm Karen Brinson Bell, Executive Director of the North Carolina State Board of Elections. You've done so much to help voting and elections in your 100 years through candidate forums, Vote411, and all the many hundreds of thousands of individuals that you've registered to vote through your voter registration drives. Thank you for all you've done for North Carolina and for being stewards of democracy. We thank Karen for that wonderful message. And now let's go to Allison, please. Allison leads the voting rights program at the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. Earlier this year, she took over as an interim executive director of SC, SCSJ. She has been the NC League's worthy advocate in several recent high profile cases, including the one that gave North Carolina citizens due process in correcting ballot errors. We are very pleased that Allison has joined the League of Women Voters National Board. Welcome to our webinar, Allison. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you so much um, to all the attendees um, for the leadership of the League of Women Voters of North Carolina and for your long friendship and partnership with me and my organization. It's been my great delight to partner with the League of Women Voters of North Carolina um, since, since 2009. Um, oftentimes as representing you um, as your attorney in the courtroom, but more often and, and even more significant to me in partnership as we push for a more inclusive democracy. It's also my great honor to serve on the board of the League of Women Voters US for the 2020 to 2022 term um, to be a voice for North Carolina and the North Carolina League in that space and to help facilitate um, communications and access to resources that way. Um, I want to acknowledge everything that Dr. Carolyn Jefferson Jackson said with, to us today 
um, and the importance of us stepping up as allies so that our sisters of color are not always the ones carrying the burden of telling history the way it happened and encouraging us to continue on our path um, and, uh, and growth as human beings uh, committed to racial equity, racial and gender equity. Um, it's my great honor to serve on the U.S. board under Dr. Deborah Turner, who you also heard from. I can tell you I spent quite a bit of time with Dr. Turner already since June, um, and she's an amazing woman, and every day I count my lucky stars that I get to work with her. But I'd be remiss if I didn't share with you the leadership of the, the National League CEO, Virginia Case. The leadership of um, such a strong Latina um, advocate has really um, changed a lot of the ways in which the National League and the State Leagues have operated. And even though we were remiss to um, only just recently incorporate DEI commitment into our bylaws, Virginia has been pushing for that it, during her entire tenure. Um, and I'm seeing the fruits of her labors um, in North Carolina, and, I, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But I wanted to spend our time, uh, the bulk of our time together, sort of um, taking a minute to celebrate our victories and what the League of Women Voters of North Carolina has accomplished in protecting democracy and what we need you all to do, um, certainly in the near term, but also the long term. Um, North Carolina has a, a long and sad history of voting discrimination uh, against people of color and uh, against women. And it, it took a very long time for us to push the reforms that were needed to even that playing field. In truth, it wasn't until the late 2000s that the reforms that the League and other um, democracy advocates were pushing finally started to even the, evening the playing field. And we saw North Carolina's political participation writ large um, coming up to, you know, off the bottom of the of the list as as far as ranks across the country it wasn't until the 2008 election that we saw um, black and white registration reaching close to parity and black and white participation turnout reaching close to parity and that was because of the reforms pushed through the legislature and advocated in front of elections boards um, that that did that and those efforts um, began to become, the attack on those efforts, the attack on unleveling the playing field began in earnest in 2010 um, with the redistricting cycle and con con has continued throughout the last decade. And at every step of the way, the League of Women Voters has been there fighting that. Um, I think you all know what cases you bring and, and what you do, but I wanna take a second to give you some numbers so you, understand how many um, voices you have, your struggles, your fights, your name, and your leadership has contributed to. Um, the League of Women Voters has been in court uh, fighting gerrymandering this entire decade. Y'all filed a lawsuit as soon as the 2011 plans were passed and attacked those as racial gerrymandering, racial gerrymanders. That fight was long and hard and was won, <laughs> but then the legislature uh, partisan gerrymandered and that fight was long and hard and, and wasn't won in the federal courts. It was my great honor to argue on behalf of the um, League of Women Voters of North Carolina last year in front of the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court did uh, let us down. They said federal courts are not going to rein in these most egregious partisan gerrymanders. But here's what I want you to feel good about. There, it was a 5-4 decision and there was a dissent written by Justice Kagan that ultimately was cited persuasively as the reason why a North Carolina state court struck down the congressional districts and the state legislative districts as partisan gerrymandering. I have never seen that in my career. It isn't lost to me, um, lost on me that a, a female justice did that 
um, recognize the fundamental injustices, um, the ways in which exclusion undermined our, or undermine our democracy. Um, but that was your work. It was your testimony. It was the record you built that did that. And so this year, finally, in 2020, we will elect representatives from districts that are finally fair. Every single one of the districts in this, uh, of these congressional districts in the state have been redrawn because of your efforts. That's 7 million registered voters um, who now are gonna be going to the polls in, um, well, starting now, but through November 3rd, who will know that they're in congressional districts that are constitutional because of the League of Women Voters. That's a big number. You also have been instrumental in fighting against um, discriminatory and onerous voter ID laws, and you keep winning over and over again. And the th the what we believe to be 300,000 North Carolina voters, predominantly um, old or disproportionately older folks, folks of color, and women um, who lack um, a valid photo ID, those 300,000 voters get to go to the polls and participate free from harassment and free from extra hurdles uh, because of the work that you, you do. Um, the work that you've done to fight for early voting and fight for same day registration, you all were um, leads in the fight to strike down House Bill 589, which was invalidated by an appellate court in 2016 as a state law designed with near surgical precision um, to undermine African American strength. You all, it was my honor to represent you there in that case. And because of that, in 2016, in 2018, in each of those general elections, 100,000 voters used same day registration. Those are voters who would not have had their votes counted, but for your willingness to fight. And there have been since 2016, millions, millions of voters who have used early voting. Um, and we use early voting now more than we do uh, election day voting millions of ballots cast via a me mechanism that your willingness to fight has preserved. And lastly, just and most recently, your willingness to fight ensured that voters, um, especially those casting an absentee ballot because they have no choice, they have health concerns, they, there is a global pandemic, they prefer to vote in person, but they have to vote for absentee, have to vote by absentee. Your efforts have guaranteed that any voter who makes a mistake that can be fixed gets the opportunity to do that on their absentee ballot. For first time voters using absentee, uh, the absentee process, it can be confusing. I spend a lot of time out there doing voter education, public education, and there's so many people who don't even realize absentee voting is a two-step process. You have to request the absentee first, then you have to send it, and that the envelope is the application. Um, you, we think that you have saved probably 115,000 votes from being discounted because of your advocacy there. Um, there are already right now 3,000 absentee ballots that have some issue with it that the cure, the cure process and opportunity to fix is already underway. And the numbers of absentee ballots returned so far are quite low compared to what they, we think they will be in the end. So 115,000 may be an, uh, an understatement. I wanted then, you know, as we're talking about what do we do now? What do we do in the next two months? What do we do in the next 100 years? I wanna thank you for the ways in which I see diversity, equity, and inclusion showing up in your everyday work. It's been my honor to work with a number of the league leaders um, who've been part of efforts to work on a gold standard for redistricting reform that centers race equity. Redistricting and, and the improper use of redistricting to gerrymander has 
all too frequently been used to disadvantage communities of color and those communities need to be central um, in conversations about what fair redistricting looks like and I see the league committing to that and doing the hard work um, to not just say any reform is better than nothing at all but but demand what is actually just um, and right for our communities. This work is hard, it is uncomfortable. There isn't an endpoint where you become quote unquote woke and it's easy. Um, it's work we're committed to, to doing over the course of our lifetimes. Um, and I'm, I am there with you. I want to support Carolyn, I wanna support Deborah. I wanna support Virginia and all of our um, friends and leaders, um, women of color doing this work. Um, being an ally is a hard and rewarding job and we owe it to our friends to do that. We also have faced, um, particularly as democracy advocates and women, a, a startling loss in the last week, um, the loss of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I know that that has a lot of folks feeling a little bit down and frustrated. And I wanna say to you just a few things on that. Justice Ginsburg is a personal hero of mine and we do her memory a dis a disjustice, an injustice and a disservice if we don't take the time and space to celebrate the glass ceiling she shattered for us. She and her life's career made such a difference um, for, for me, for my ability to practice law, to practice law in the highest courts, for women of color um, to be seen and heard and, and um, accepted in legal spaces. Um, and our moral compass needs to be, um, in these frustrating partisan times, our moral compass needs to be not just putting a token woman on the court, but recognizing the clarity of her convictions, her voice, and that we want someone with her life experiences, with our life experiences and our commitment to an inclusive democracy to be heard and part of the conversation on that court. Um, remember that she is a, a, a moral compass for us, that she broke glass ceilings that no one thought she could. She started law school and people harangued her saying, how can you take the place of a man at this law school, you are taking up valuable space. And we find that in, in our lives and our work all of the time. Um, we have to fight to, rec to be recognized as belonging in the space we occupy. So let's keep up that fight. Let's recognize that we need to make more space for more voices so that DEI shows up in every aspect of our work and that we fulfill her desire to move ourselves towards a better, um, inclusive, more just society and celebrate what her life is, that her memory is a blessing to us every single day. These upcoming weeks will be difficult. Um, I, I certainly have not lived through an election like this before. Um, and I lived in Florida in 2000. So I've seen it bad. I'd, I'm certainly not naive or downplaying um, how hard this is going to be. But the league's voice, trust me when I say, when I'm in national spaces, um, the league's voice matters and you all can make an incredible difference in steadying the ship through these troubled times. Um, the League of Women Voters, in part because of its years of steadfast commitment to nonpartisan um, commentary, nonpartisan space, um, its forums, the League is trusted as a, a nonpartisan um, entity and a steadying entity. Um, the history of this organization, there is nothing um, insignificant about being around for a hundred years. This is an institution that is respected and is, is rooted um, and we need to lean on that. Folks are going to need to be reassured. They are gonna need to be reassured that we're out there fighting for their votes to be counted, that we're fighting for them to have um, 
safe mechanisms of participation, that we're going to fight for the results of the election to be respected. And we are going to do all of that work together, but we also need to convey um, that sense of commitment to our friends, our families, our neighbors. Folks need um, not complacency, but a sense of hope um, and a, a bit of sunlight, um, someone to lean on. And I think we can do that for, for them. I go back to, uh, to Justice Ginsburg and know that we can be unflinching in our demands uh, for gender equity, racial equity, reproductive rights, and voting rights, and um, still be trusted sources of information, still be uh, reliable places for voters to get information. And we can be that steadying force that this country needs during turbulent times. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, don't lose hope. That is not what Justice Ginsburg wants. That is not what our country needs. The work is hard and we need to stay committed to doing it and you're on the right track. We'll be there with you. Thank you so much for everything you've done and for having me with you, uh, inviting me to speak to you today. Um, well, thank you so much, Allison. I mean, I'm, I'm always inspired to, to hear you um, speak. This is Jennifer. Um, and, and, um, we're, you know, we, we, there's been, again, a, a, an outpouring of, of support and, and uh, you know, interest in your work and, and everyone and, and admiration for your, for your contributions. Um, and we do have also a couple of questions um, that I think we can get to here. Uh, there were, there's a lot of people were talking about RPG's legacy and the need to be ruthless, even though we are ruthless. And um, what's the main lesson that we can learn from her legacy and what in particular gives you the strength to continue the fight no matter what? So, you know, one of the things that um, struck me as, as powerful that can, it, it was a little bit later in Justice Ginsburg's career as she became more of a dissenter. She wrote a lot of incredibly important opinions early in her career. And as the court changed, she sort of became known as her, her notorious RBG um, persona was sort of linked to her vigorous dissents. But there's two things that I take away from that. Um, even if you don't win in the short in the short term, that idea that dissent can be powerful, that it can be inspiring, that's something that that gives me hope. I know that we're not going to achieve um, all of our goals immediately. The art the arc bends slowly towards justice. It does bend, but it bends slowly. Um, so the power in dissent um, is inspiring to me and I hope to everyone else. And also that you don't have to be popular. Um, dissenting, um, voicing that which, you know, the majority doesn't want to hear or the decision makers don't want to hear, there's power in that and we need to lean into our power there. It won't only inspire um, uh, folks around us, but it will make a record and make um, history harder for those who would want to revise it later. And I think that's sort of been a theme through this event today of we want to own our history, recognize our history, document it, even the hard parts. And RBG did that every day. Uh, well, thank you so much. We, we do have another question, but I will, we're in the interest of time, um, we're going to uh, have to have to move on, but we'll send you the question, which is from one of our lead leaders, and perhaps uh, you can answer it that privately. Absolutely. Thanks Thank so you. Much. I really appreciate your remarks. Okay, I'll take us going forward. We have a couple of shout outs and from different partners. I'm Jennifer Copeland, Executive Director of the North Carolina Council of Churches. And I'm here to talk about the League of Women Voters. Everyone's heard of the League, right? They're the ones who make sure you're registered to vote and actually do go vote. That's what I thought. And until a couple of years ago when the North Carolina Council of Churches joined arms with the League to talk about redistricting reform, also known as gerrymandering. That's when I began to meet the amazing people who make up the League. 
They know democracy is about simply more than voting. They know democracy is about fair districts, access to the polls, an educated electorate. And they're willing to do the hard work to bring about those realities. Many people sit around and talk about what's wrong with our democracy. There is so much to talk about lately. But the League works to fix our democracy. Now, whenever I'm part of a group planning an event or coordinating a strategy, if someone from the League is in the room, I know we will get things done. Congratulations, League of Women Voters, on your 100th birthday celebration. May you have many more. I'm Jen Hello, North Carolina League of Women Voters. I'm Mark Joel, the immediate past president of NCAE and an executive committee member of the National Education Association. First of all, I'd like to thank Joe Nicholas for our outstanding leadership of the North Carolina League and her great partnership with NCAE throughout her tenure, and I know that partnership will continue with the upcoming years. I'm here today to congratulate the League on starting its second century of service to democracy. We all know the importance of this upcoming election and the need to ensure that North Carolinians are engaged in our process and will vote either by mail-in at one of our early voting sites or on election day. As we are still under the grasp of a raging COVID-19, we need to ensure that our citizens are aware of the safe and secure ways to voice their vote. The North Carolina League of Women Voters has a long history of advocacy and a unique statewide network of volunteers working very hard to see that democracy works for all North Carolinians. The League has been invaluable in their contributions to voter education, registration, monitoring of election boards, and providing candidate information. The League's service to our greatest human and civil right, free and fair elections, is invaluable. Happy 100 years of advocacy. We believe that public education is the foundation of democracy, and we're proud to celebrate you and your tremendous network of volunteers. Thank you, and happy 100 North Carolina League of Women Voters. We'd now like to talk to you about our Vote 411 and how you can help us make it even a more effective tool in educating voters and getting out the vote in this election. First, we'll take a look at a brief video which summarizes the importance of the League's signature tool all across the nation. When you vote, something powerful happens to your voice. Your single ballot becomes a megaphone. You stand out and tell your community and our nation what you want for our future. Vote411.org is your tool for accurate and unbiased election information on the issues that affect you and the people you care about. Through Vote411, you can register to vote using our online form that only takes a few minutes to complete, available in multiple languages. Check your registration status and find out where to vote right on the Vote411 homepage and get important up-to-the-minute information on the elections happening in your state and local community through the Vote 411 interactive map. Your voice is strong and important. It is a critical part of our democracy. Vote411.org is your tool for all the election information you need. Get online, get the facts, and make your voice heard on Election Day. Powered by the League of Women Voters Education Fund. When you what can you learn from this Vote 411? Did you know that you can learn who is on your ballot? Were you aware that there are 513 races here in North Carolina with over 979 candidates? It talks about the candidates' positions, where you register, find out where you can vote early, confirm your election day polling place, because if it's like mine, mine was changed this previous year. Get reliable info about absentee ballots. 2020 primary voters in 24 North Carolina counties representing 56,193 unique users and 79,970 website sessions utilize this site. Next slide, please. As you can see here, Vote 411 is why we need your help with that. Vote 411 is a great tool that distinguishes the league from other organizations, but people don't know about it. We must become more proactive by getting this word out and we have to do it quickly. Thankfully, a lot of our local leagues have been doing information about Vote 411 in their areas. 
we all know publicity is expensive. The LWVNC funnels contributions to the local leagues for their local public publicity. We would like to sponsor a media blitz, including radio and print, and we need people to help us to raise funds so we can get the word out to all of our voters. Next slide, please. They offer um, a lot of, Vote 411 is a great tool. What it does is uh, it does help us to get things imported and then we can offer things in printed version with the ability to distribute guides that have been very limited because of the pandemic. What a testament of hard work to the LWBNC to provide such a superior resource to the voters of North Carolina, Vote 411. But people don't know about it. We must become more proactive. We must be able to get the word out and we have to get it out quickly. So publicity, as we were saying, is expensive. Some of you may not know that the state league supports Vote 411 all across the state so that even the smaller leagues have funding to promote it. Recently, the state league had made grants to 10 local leagues for Vote 411 publicity. The money has gone for mailing campaigns, billboards, tabling events, and uh, other activities. And now we will be making more grants over the next few weeks. In addition, the State League has taken on all the expense from National for the Vote 411, the licensing fee and the data management so that locals can keep their money for their own localized publicity. We would like to sponsor a media blitz over the coming weeks, including radio and print. We need you to help us fund, raise funds so that we can get the word out to all of our voters. Next slide, please. In summary, we hope that you will be willing to support the statewide efforts to expand the Vote 411 brand throughout North Carolina. We have placed in the chat function the URL for making your donation. Also, here's the link to our website where you can make a gift. And if you haven't visited our website, please do. It's a new website. On behalf of all the 19 leagues throughout the state, we thank you for your support. Next slide, please. And I'd like to remind you there are other ways to support the league. You can join. You can subscribe to our mailing list. You can keep up with the latest news. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter and also YouTube. We have become more media. We thank you for participating in this webinar. We love to hear your comments and questions for follow-up. You can put anything in the chat and we'll respond to it. As Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join. That's what the League of Women Voters of North Carolina is doing. And as Carolyn and Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, and also, John Lewis, the fight is not over yet. We must continue empowering our voters and defending democracy. Thank you very much for participating today. Join the League of Women Voters of North Carolina. Enjoy your day.